this week on The Gadget Show, Susie and I go into combat. To put cutting-edge walking boots through their paces. Go, go, go! To experience the awesome real-life version of one of the world's most successful shoot-em-up computer games. Oh. Yes! And to test drive a pair of miniature tanks. Yes! Also, John looks at the best all-in-one remotes with the help of broadcaster Paul Ross. Crash cars, all in the interests of gadget testing. Hello and welcome to the Gadget Show. This week, Susie and I have spent most of the week dressed in rather sexy combat camouflage fatigues. Uh, in fact, I wanted to wear them for the opening of the show, but Susie made the point that if we did, you wouldn't better see us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this week's challenge was all about combat. So we tested a whole load of gadgets in a whole load of muddy situations where we were shot at, chased and shouted at by a very large, muscly man with a shaved head. Thank you. That's really sweet of you. Because mm -hmm. I, I agree I've, I've buffed up a little bit. No, no, no. You're not looking bad yourself either. Although you could work on the triceps. You're a cheeky dog. So the first part of our challenge involved these dirty great big... Muddy boots. Yeah, there's no point in thinking that one of these refty tufty outdoor types that can yomp their way around Europe without stopping for tea if your footwear is a load of old rubbish. But the good news for gadget fans is that the technology revolution hasn't escaped boots. I mean, these things are highly evolved. In order to make these lighter and stronger, this particular pair are made of PTFE membrane event fabric. Brilliant! Yeah, but I don't think you can beat a good old-fashioned strong pair of leather boots. Leather's where it's at. I mean, you can't beat nature, can you? Moo. Moo? Yeah, moo. OK, I think it's fair to say that as we headed out on the first stage of our uh, combat challenge, we couldn't even decide which of the two boots were best. So, we thought we'd put them both through some very thorough, and for us, painful, painful. testing. We both chose the best boots in each class. I got a pair of Scarpa SLM3s made from lovingly crafted Italian leather. Whereas I've gone for man-made fabric with these Carrymore KSB event boots. The mission is simple, to escape and evade this army of pink armors as they, rawr, as they chase us down that muddy path and into the woods. In order for our boots to not get shot, we're going to have to take them through swamps, through mud, there's going to be rabbits trying to poo on them. It's going to be carnage, the perfect environment to test out our feet-orientated tech. Three, two, one, go! As well as seeing how durable the boots were, this would be the ultimate test of waterproofness. Oh my god, look at it! Whose feet would be clean and dry by the end. Go, go, go! <sighs> These caramel boots are absolutely fantastic. It's like wearing a very supportive pair of slippers. A membrane made of expanded polytetrafluoroethane lets sweat out but doesn't let water in, while a special treatment repels oils and salts. On the uppers, the fibres are injected with a thermoplastic, which should make them tougher than Susie's leather boots. <laughs> James, help me out! I'm stuck! Where'd go? <laughs> oh, God! I'm surviving, please. My SLM3s are billed as the definitive year-round walking boot. I've got to say, they do need a bit of wearing in. They're a bit stiff. And to do that, you really need to go on short walks, not running around being shot at by an army of paintballers like I am. I've got to go. These boots are moulded under hot steam for an astonishing 48 hours to ensure they always keep the same shape. The leather is also infused with silicon to make it more waterproof than Jason's synthetic membrane boots. With the paintballers evaded, it was time to see who'd got soggy socks. Satisfyingly, both boots had kept us completely dry. So, on to the next test, strength. And in particular, this is a test of lace strength. There's no point in trying to climb Everest if your boots are held together by bits of flimsy string. So, please, could you tie a knot yes. in those? We decided to test the strength of our laces by getting Jason to, um, well, use them to hang from a tree. <laughs> My Scarpa laces are made out of nylon, but they've been woven just like a climbing rope, which makes them super strong. In our test, they lasted 18 seconds. Hey! Let's test your boots. Make the bad woman stop. Come on, get up, get up. My Caramore laces are also nylon, but aren't woven like Susie's. Basically, they're just oversized shoelaces. Ready? 
Don't I feel that good? No. <laughs> oh, oh, what? What a test! Oh. Rubbish laces! So, after two tests, my Scarpa SLM3s had edged into the lead. But we still had one last test to go, and for that we decided to break out the big guns. It would take months of hard walking to find out which pair of boots were sturdiest. So, we were going to use these Golf 4 FB432 armoured personnel carriers that have been modified to fire paintball pellets at 320 feet per second. We're going extreme! We've hung our boots up on that target over there, and we're going to fire at them until I can take no more. Enemy boots! 12 o'clock high! Fire! Oh! Your boots are going down, Sergeant Perry! Fire! Time after time, the boots got pelted and pelted and pelted. Ready to fire. Roger that! Fire! And Jason's boots seem to be suffering a lot more than mine. Oh, I feel so manly! Oh, look how pink yours are! Oh, they're bright pink. Your leather, of course, yeah. has been hit, but it just hasn't absorbed the energy. <laughs> Yay! My scarf has won! I know. Although I've got to say, the Caramors, if you're not just a weekend walker, they're a good solution because they're lightweight and they aren't quite waterproof. But in terms of durability, they don't even touch these. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't even feel the paintballs hitting them. It was I incredible. Know, yeah. That hurt me, that bit. <laughs> OK, loads more still to come from our combat challenge this week. And believe us, it gets bigger, better and badder. Jason and I get very involved in an extraordinary real-world version of a computer game. Also still to come tonight, John and broadcaster Paul Ross find the perfect replacement for a house full of remote controls. And I test a clever new in-car gadget by crashing a lot. Now, I want to talk to you about doobries or oofa doofers or whatever you call remote controls in your house. The trouble with getting more gadgets is you get more remote controls to get stuck down the side of the sofa or in the back of the cat. However, salvation is at hand in the shape of these universal remotes. One remote that you program to control all your gadgets. As ever, the question is, which one's best? Well, don't touch your remote for the next five minutes and you'll find out. I got a house full of electronic equipment, each with an easily losable remote control. Ah! And invited broadcaster and TV addict Paul Ross to help me test three of the very latest universal remotes that promise to replace all these originals. Well, you've got DAB radios, you've got your sound system, you've yep. got DVD, home telly, cinema. home yep. cinema, cuddly toy, walk. But there are supposedly solutions, and we're going to test three of them today, universal remotes that do away with all of that and leave you with just one. First, I owe a bit peckish. I'd love a snack. I've got some curly whirlies in the cupboard. After getting suitably prepared from my well-stocked snack cupboard... Oh, it's a jumbo pack. Brilliant. I showed Paul the most basic model, the one for all URC 7780. So quite attractive a... looking, quite nice and mm. shiny black, nice bit of kit. The one for all comes with a manual containing thousands of numerical codes that can be used to program every remote controlled gadget you own, in theory. Add device, TV, enter. The television is flashing at you angrily, nothing has happened. Mm. But once we'd entered the correct code... 0508. The one for all controlled the TV just as well as the original. Great! And it was the same procedure with the Morant's home cinema. Enter in 0539. 0539. OK, excellent. Good. So, with both devices working, it was time for more snacks. Where's the curly word? Is it? Where the remote control should be. That's where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and we headed for the bedroom. Now, I've got another Toshiba telly in here. So, uh, I'm hoping that I don't need another number. Which side of the bed do you normally use? I'm normally that side. All oh, right, OK, good. Luckily, the code for the bedroom TV was the same. Oh, there you go. Brilliant. But the manual didn't include a code for the Humax personal video recorder. Ah. So, we went to the kitchen for more snacks and to try out the dab radio. Chilly heat wave. Yeah, I will mind something to say, yeah. Try yeah. that. Well. The Vita's a new model with no code in the manual, but the one for all was able to learn commands one by one from the Vita's own remote, a time-consuming process. Yes. All in all, then, the one for all was rather hit and miss. Now, the next one I've got is a bit more expensive, but I hope we won't have to use any of those codes. I think it's going to tell us what it what to do as we go along. The Philips Prestigo does away with a manual. It has a database of models in the handset. A bit more styled, isn't it, with that bit of chrome in there, that burnished it is. chrome? It's also got a much bigger display. 
By selecting the make and model and following simple instructions on the screen, we were able to program both the TV and home cinema system in a couple of minutes. But this is fantastic. The manual is effectively in the device. The Philips was also hot stuff in the bedroom, quickly learning the controls for the TV and PVR. Yep, straight away. Must. However, the Philips failed to program a series of operations using a single activity button. Mm. So now what you're hoping is going to happen is it will all come on at one go. Yeah. That's not coming on, is it? No. But that is frustrating. It's a shame yeah. because everything else about this so far has been yeah. pretty good. Absolutely. The Philips didn't recognise the Vita radio, but like the one for all, it was able to learn from the original Vita remote. Oh, let's change the channel. Yes! Gone from galaxy channel. to heart. This was so simple to use, no flicking through the manual, nice easy display. Mm. OK, that's a bit sensitive, but you get used to that, and I actually think it's better styled. <laughs> Finally, I had my most expensive universal remote to show Paul, the Logitech Harmony One. I must say, the first impression, it's more plasticky than the £70 one. Exactly. It doesn't feel like it's £100. It's a bit of solid, doesn't it? If that makes sense. The Logitech works by downloading information from its website and transferring it to the remote. But to do that, it needs model numbers off our equipment. Don't drop it! Where the hell am I supposed to look? We did manage to enter the correct details without any breakages. Look, there okay. it is. So now we need the Marantz. Ooh, be careful Done. with it. That's no, on the very bottom. But the whole process was long-winded and complex. Remind me, this Logitech is a labour-saving device, mm. is it? OK, that's cool. Mm, really and that's good, yeah. It took ages, but we could eventually programme multiple activities like turning on the TV and playing a DVD by pressing a single activity button. Oh, now tell come on with one button press. Yeah. It's gone to the right channel. And it's playing. The Logitech actually does handle those basic activities much yeah. easier. But in the bedroom, the Logitech failed even to find the second Toshiba telly on its database and tried to find the nearest match. He wants to know all about all the plugging, the inputs it's got. Oh, it's key detected. Good. The caption there should have read, some considerable time <laughs> later. <laughs> Even Gandhi would have hurled this from the 33rd floor of his tower block and chucked his loincloth after it. The Logitech eventually managed to work all the equipment, but I knew Paul had another appointment. Believe me, then, John, I've got plenty to do, John. I've got plenty to do. You haven't done the damn no, radio yet. Honestly, I'll take that on trust. Do you think the, the, the DAB's fine. I'm going to take something for the journey. You'll probably have to do it manually. No, no, honestly, that'll be fine. You enjoy You knock yourself out with the DAB. <laughs> Bye, thank you! <laughs> <laughs> Well, Paul seemed a little bit frustrated at the end of that day. I think he was, he was genuinely annoyed by all that programming, yeah. and I can see why, because they aren't particularly good as a breed, these universal no. remotes. I mean, you might think I'm going to give the Logitech 1G for all that frustrating programming, but I'm actually going to give it 2G, <laughs> okay. because of all the three, it actually is the only one that can really sophisticatedly control your stuff, so you can actually, if you spend weeks programming yeah, you it... You a computer programmer to get you, to, get to you it. You will be able to press DVD, your DVD will come on, your satellite will go off, and all that sort of thing. It is sophisticated, if you you spend all that time okay. with it. And what about the one for all? Well, that's also going to get two Gs, because in its own way, that also has a very fiddly set-up process with that sort of tiny display and all those codes. But it is the cheapest of the three. OK, and the Philips? I'd give three Gs for the Philips, undoubtedly the best of the three. If you don't demand too much of it, it is very easy to set up. But some of the things in the flat, we had to get it to learn those manually. And also, the activity settings, unlike the Logitech, where you can ultimately make those work, with, with the Philips, they, they just defeated me. OK, so the yeah. Philips Press to go is the uh, universal remote control of choice for the gadget show, although I think it's fair to say it's only the best of a bad bunch. Right, I want to show you this rather natty little gadget that I've been testing this week. But if you're one of those people that thinks that there's already too many cameras on the road watching you, then, well, quite frankly, you're going to hate it. We're all familiar with police camera footage showing boy racers driving dangerously at 100 miles an hour. Well, imagine how useful it would be to have technology like that in your own car in case you witnessed reckless driving yourself. Well, now you can. This little camera is called the Road Scan and it fits very neatly behind your rear view mirror and enables you to film up to 10 incidents at 8 frames per second. In here is a tiny little computer that records the time and the date of the incident and also the acceleration and deceleration of the car. The Road Scan is always recording footage onto its hard drive. After 20 seconds of filming, it simply tapes over itself again with another 20 seconds. However, if I press this little red record button here, it will save the last 14 seconds of footage and continue to record the next six seconds, so you end up with 20 seconds of film. So after I witnessed some reckless
reckless driving, I can catch the whole thing on camera. Don't cut me up like that! Right, I'm going to record that. I'm going to have all that on camera and this six seconds that I'm talking through now to show you. And this could provide invaluable proof if you ever needed to make an insurance claim. But the really clever bit is the road scan's G-sensor. If I'm involved in an accident, or even if I just brake hard, the road scan automatically detects that jolt, that movement, and it saves the footage, which gives me all the hard evidence that I need to prove that it wasn't my fault. Look, I'll show you. There you go, the light's gone green, and it saved that footage. So if I brake a little bit too hard, the sensor is triggered and the footage is stored. But to really test this little device, I need to employ some professional help. Oh, good. Russ is here. Precision driver Russ Swift is famous for his ability to throw cars into tight spaces and drive on two wheels. But the road scan is an accident camera, so we jumped into our rusty, sorry, trusty Volvo to see how well it would document an actual collision. <laughs> Oh, I think you might have just glanced that. Russ soon got into the shunting swing as he beat Mary Hell out of a couple of parked cars. Oh. Oh, I don't think it's your fault. <laughs> That's definitely green. Whoa! Uh, yep, I think you can safely say it's recording. The camera is triggered by half a G's worth of force, so every single one of these shunts should have been stored by the road scan. <laughs> Time to analyse the evidence. Right, let's play this file here, because I think it's one way you might have bumped the car. No, 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 I didn't bump it. Well, we've got hard evidence here that might say you did. I deny everything. Look, there it is, the point of impact. Look at that. Good quality picture, it isn't is. it? Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be that good. Yeah, and the number plate, you can see it perfectly clearly, so it's exactly. excellent evidence. There's the blip at the actual point of impact. Yeah, and if we just open up the graph, because software is so easy to navigate, you can see it right there. Oh, wow, obviously. Is that just yeah. over a... 1.008G. That's good, isn't it? So you've got the speed, yeah. acceleration, time, you've got the date, yeah. you've got the impact, the and you've got all the, the pictures. Second. You know what else you can do that's really good? If there's any squabbling, you can go back frame by frame. Look. And actually freeze it at the you point of impact. You can actually see that point of impact. I'm afraid you're guilty as charged. Put the cuffs on now. I want to be Russ. I know, he's awesome. Oh, man, I would love to get the supermarket. Can you or imagine? The cafe, the cafe near my house. One handbrake turn into the space. <gasps> oh. Good skills. Really good skills. But a really great little gizmo, I think. You know, Absolutely for your insurance. Brilliant. No, it's a great idea. In fact, I'm surprised that it's taken this while to come to market. I can, I can imagine it'll be very popular. Yeah, I'm sure it will. If you fancy having one of these, by the way, in your car, then stick around, because we're going to give one away in this week's competition, complete with a man that's going to come around and fit it in your car for you. Is it Russ? No, it's not Russ, sadly. I know, he's amazing. Um, that's coming up later, but right now, it's time for the focus group. <laughs> Each week on The Focus Group, John, Jason and I present the best new gadgets that we can find in a particular category to our focus group, and then they tell us which one they like the best. This week we have come to the Art Lounge in Birmingham uh, because we're testing photo printing devices, and our focus group is made up of photography students, all of you, aren't you? Yeah. Lucky devils. Right, guys, I'm going to go first. Walk this way. Right, chaps, this is the world's first digital photo frame with integrated printer on the back. You've got your LCD screen here, eight inches, but all the magic happens behind in this little box. And if I can just show you this cartridge, this has got your ink and your paper, so you get 36 prints out of here, six by fours. And it just goes in the bottom under here, so it just slides in there, so there's absolutely no mess. And it works off your remote control. So if I could just have a little bit of help. What's your name? Steve. Right, Steve, let me grab you for a second. Just come and stand here. If you just press stop on that remote, that takes you back to your menu. Just select any one you want. OK, press print. And then literally, in seconds, you'll end up with a 6x4 glossy print. And there it is. A beauty. It's a world's first. <laughs> <laughs> Love him. It's like a new toy boy look. <laughs> Chantal has very kindly agreed to help me demonstrate my printer. Could you bear to take a yeah. picture of me oh. using my mobile phone? 
Now, mobile phones, indeed all digital cameras are great because you take the picture, it's there instantly on the screen and you can share them round, you know, look at them and see what they're like. Um, what you can't do though is print them out unless you're carrying a printer, which is where Polaroid, traditional masters of the instant print, have stepped in with this new Polaroid Pogo. Essentially, it's a Bluetooth, highly portable printer. If you go into the gallery and press Bluetooth and send, yeah. and it should print out, sending, brilliant. The prints use actual dye embedded in the surface of the paper, which is activated by the printer. They're waterproof, they're tearproof, and they're also supposed to be very fade resistant. They also have a, a self-adhesive back, so you can peel that off and stick them places. And it takes about 60 seconds to come up with a print, which uh, isn't too bad. I see why you're a student of photography, even with such uninspiring yeah. subjects. OK, this is the PhotoFuse Smart Canvas, OK? It's a really simple idea. It means that for 20 quid, you get everything you need to get your digital picture onto a canvas. I need a volunteer. What's your name? Rose. Brilliant. OK, Rose, come on, come on over. In the pack, you get some software. That's what it looks like. You can do loads of filters and stuff, but essentially, you start with your digital picture, you press print, it comes out of your printer. That's what we've got there. Now, that's quite special. It's got this thing inside it called Smart Film. I've got one I prepared earlier here, Rose. It's the same picture that's printed out of a printer, but put onto this board. But I do need you to uh, place this special mounting frame on top of my image there. The next stage is we need to peel this cardboard off the back. Nicely done. Next, this backing needs to be taken off so that we reveal the very thin and delicate smart film underneath. How's that? Have you done it? Yep. Great, we're almost there. All we need now is for you to grab this canvas, line it up as best you can. Again, don't, don't worry too much, Rose. Laying the canvas on there. And now this is the best bit. You now need to work in with a brush nice and deep into all the fibres of the canvas so that you end up with a, a, you know, a nice even print. Right, now, I need you to cut the image out, OK? So, obviously, be careful, please, Rose. <laughs> there it is. How's that? What about that? Yes. I think that's really, really good. <laughs> After we'd shown off our gadgets, we left the focus group to get properly hands-on and print some of their own pickies so they could make their minds up about what they like the best. It makes the images look very professional. I thought it was quick and effective. It's very portable and it can print off very excellent pictures. It's inexpensive, it's fun, it's quite quick. I just think it's really fun and easy to use. And I also like the way that you can preview your pictures before you print them. I think that's really good. OK, focus group, uh, the moment has come. It's now time to vote, all right? So starting off with Susie, her digital frame printer. If you'd like to go with that, raise them high. OK, one, two, three, Thank you, four. see Steve. Yeah. See my little toy boy, yeah, Steve. Yeah, he's there, yeah. yeah. All right, how about number two, uh, the Polaroid Pogo? If you'd like to take that home with you, put your hands up high. Very popular. Ooh, one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good job. Ooh, very, very good. good. Haul. Or if you'd like to go with the photo fuse photo to canvas idea, put your hands up in the air now, please. Four. Not bad. Hey, it's a good mix today, isn't it? It is a really good mix, but like nevertheless, it. we do have an overall winner. It's the Polaroid Pogo. Pogo. Well, hey. Time for another short break now. But after that, Jason and I go head to head in battle, testing the awesome okay. new real world version of a shoot 'em up computer game. Welcome back. It's time for this week's top five. Now, you might be pleased to find out, if you're a fan of the top fives, that we've started putting them on our website, 5.tv forward slash gadget show. All you do is go to the home page, click the on TV section, and you should see the latest top five on the page in the middle there. If you want to see ones from previous episodes, just press the previously button, and they're all there for your delectation. This week's top five, though, is all about things that get you up in the morning. Alarm clocks. <laughs> Getting up in the morning is never fun, but there are some pretty cool new gadget alarm clocks which could make your mornings more bearable. So what are the top five you can buy? Well, set your alarm for now, because that's what I'm going to tell you. <sighs> Number five is this, the flying alarm clock. And as the name suggests, it flies. You get this little ball and a propeller in the box, you just clip them together, whack them on the top of your alarm clock, Set the time and expect a waking up experience like no other. Night night. <coughs> Unfortunately, to turn the alarm off, you have to catch the propeller and stick it back on the base of the clock. <laughs> it's a little too loud to wake you up softly, and that is possibly the most physical 
waking experience I've ever had, but I really like the concept. In at number four is this mean-looking clock, the Sonic Bomb. Perfect for those who have real trouble getting up in the morning. It sounds an alarm at a staggering 113 decibels. That's louder than a helicopter, a chainsaw, or being front row at a rock concert. It comes with this bed vibrator, which is basically a miniature subwoofer that you put under your pillow. When the alarm goes off, it shakes you awake. Night-night. That's unreal! <laughs> look at this thing, look! Can you see that? <laughs> oh my god, that's scary! Alarm clock number three is this little chap. He's called Clocky, and he might not look like much, but believe me, he's going to give you the runaround. When he goes off in the morning, he spools up those wheels, jumps off the table, and finds a place to hide anywhere in the room. It could be under the bed, under your cupboard, Lord only knows where. And the only way to switch him off is to find him and hit the snooze button. Night night. And Clocky certainly knows how to get you out of bed in the morning. I'm not going to pretend it's a nice experience, but it is one of the most effective alarm clocks I've ever tried. Ah. In at number two is the retro iPod alarm clock. I love this thing. It looks just like an alarm clock, but it's a lot more sophisticated. There's a docking bay at the front for any iPod except the shuffle on the iPod Touch. You move this simple clicking device here to the desired position, depending on what iPod you've got. Whack your player into the cradle, look at this, it automatically syncs and finds its way with software inside the alarm clock to your internal clock on your iPod. It then plays whatever track you've set to play from your iPod's memory via these 360 degree omnidirectional speakers. And there's also a lovely chrome volume knob on the end, so I'm just gonna turn it to full volume. The question is though, will it wake me up? No, no. I What a way to wake up your very own personal playlist to get you up and in a good mood. My number one alarm clock is the Philips Wake Up Light. It's a really cool concept. The idea is that it encourages you to wake up in a much more natural way than conventional alarm clocks do. It uses light and sound to wake you up naturally. The light starts to slowly build in intensity half an hour before you want to wake up. And there are also a selection of different sounds to accompany the light, like birds singing or waves crashing. The idea is that you wake up. You're not woken up. Night, night. The whole experience is supposed to have a positive effect on your energy hormones, which means you'll feel tippity top and full of energy for the whole day. That is really nice. It's like a warm glow from the sun. Hey, it's like in the night my house fell down and I'm lying in the garden looking up and the trees are swaying and the birds are singing. You know, aside from the fact that eventually I'm gonna have to get up and, you know, bring the insurance company and rebuild my house. It is a lovely feeling of being outside. Do you really sleep in your pants? No, completely in the buff. <laughs> Ow! Ow! We're wearing these patches on our arms because they're part of a new gadget called Mindwire V5. It's kind of one stage on, really, from rumble pads that give you a kind of physical sensation in your hand. Except now when I get banged by another car or hit a post, I feel it in my actual muscles. I mean, we're both feeling the sensation, aren't we, as an electric pulse, as our muscles constrict. Yes, it's quite painful. But basically, what it's doing is it's making you feel as though you're part of the game, so yeah. you're integrated. Absolutely. I mean, it seems that there is a peripheral like this coming out almost every week. Things designed to just try and bridge that gap between the gaming world and reality, mm. just to try and make gaming more exciting and visceral. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that, because it leads us quite nicely onto the second part of this week's challenge. Remember, this Sorry. week's challenge is all about <laughs> combat. And the second part was about Jason and I going head-to-head -head in a shoot-em-up computer game. Here comes a wall. Ready? 
Ow! Ow! And it really was exciting and visceral. This is the latest version of one of the world's most popular shoot 'em up computer games, Rainbow Six Vegas 2. In the game, you're part of a multinational task force comprising counter terrorism experts from around the globe. Oh! Yes! The game uses the very latest technology to let you actually become a character in the game. Oh! Hey! Look, that's me! And that's Susie with a helmet on. You can simply take a photo of yourself on the Xbox webcam, then import it into the game and onto your character. The only thing is, Jace, yes. I actually look like Michael Jackson and you look like Bruce Willis. What's obviously, that about? Obviously, the latter is a very accurate depiction of, uh, of my Hollywood good looks. As usual, Jason, the gamer geek, quickly got to grips with the controls, but he had a little surprise coming. We're not actually here to test this game at all. You know, for years, computer games have been developed to emulate what happens in the real world, but now it's gone full circle. Real-life games are being developed to emulate what happens in computer games, and that's what we're here to test. Go, go, go! Go! Put your game down, eh? Okay? Suddenly, a load of armed men stormed in and bundled us into the back of a Humvee. We were being manhandled by a company called Warfighters, who brought Rainbow Six Vegas 2 to life. We were about to play the game in the real world. I'd be playing the part of sunglass-wearing special ops. And I'd be a bad guy in a balaclava, knitted by my nan. Go! First up, we had to brief our teams about the mission. Right, guys, our mission is to take Jason out. Our mission brief is quite straightforward. We've got to take out Miss Perry, all right? You've got to protect me at all times. Take as many of the other boys as you like. That's fine, but Perry is the target, OK? Five metres spread. Let's go! To translate the gameplay into the real world with no danger of anyone getting actually hurt requires the use of some extraordinary technology. Deep up and keep it tight. Oh. No bullets, not even paint pellets. You just fire amplified light. The AGIWS is a wireless rifle. It's perfect for this kind of outdoor environment. Sir! Inside this barrel is an infrared transmitter in an optical tube. It's focused, so it's incredibly accurate, up to a thousand feet. Look out! The gun is controlled with a box that sits in the webbing around your waist. It connects to the gun via Bluetooth. The box is the gun's brain. It keeps track of the scores and stores the gun's sound effects. The technology in these guns is unique. Even the US Armed Forces are looking at using it for their training simulations. Where's the enemy? Tango's top, Tango's right at the top left-hand corner. We've got to get round here to that right corner. Each magazine carries 100 rounds. And if I've shot 20, the memory in the magazine will remember there's 80 left. So if I get shot, I can throw my magazine to a teammate. I'll just load it. You simply aim for your opponent's tactical vest, which contains sensors, and if you score a hit, their gun becomes disabled, they hear a flat line, and it's time to play dead. Give that man an Oscar. Because of the longer range of the weapons, you have to be on your guard all the time. It's a lot more tactical and strategic than paintballing. Sniper on the roof! Sniper team pulling back! Here, a sniper can pick people off knowing his light beam won't be blown off course like a paint pellet. But for all the technology, you can't beat good old-fashioned pyrotechnics for a bit of atmosphere. The computer game costs £40, whereas a five-hour session in the real-world version costs £55 a player. Delta attack! Part of the excitement is definitely the physicality of this game, but there's no single-player mode here. It takes a gang of mates to really make it work. Before long, Susie's squad had me surrounded. All the rest of my team were out of the game and had to lie perfectly still. Cover! Cover! Formation. My only chance was to play dead too. Pretend to join them. Have we completed the mission? Search the bodies until we have confirmation. Search the bodies. Right, we have no confirmation on target. Extended line, search the perimeter. Switch for anything that moves. I just had to lie in wait and choose my moment. Cover me, you're not covering me! Ah! Yay! Oh. 
I've got Susie. Her team may have got me, but I'd already won the game. It had been exhilarating, exciting, and of course, the best bit was we'd had a great big play battle without anyone getting a single scratch or bruise. Oh, oh. Do you know what? I really thought that I got the tactics just right to beat you in that game. You did absolutely brilliantly, but of course the rules stated that I had to get you, and I did, even though I got taken out by all of you men. Yeah, so what you're saying is that I you won, won the, the challenge. challenge! Yeah, but you know what? The technology was extraordinary. I mean, those guns were really, really exact, weren't yeah. they? I, I agree. I mean, the guns were very heavy, weren't they? Mm. So when you were aiming them, it was uh, quite a, a different experience to, say, using a paintball gun. Very, very realistic. Yep. Clever technology, but the challenge isn't over yet. I've only won stage two. Susie won the first one. The decider is still to come, and it's a battle that saw me and Susie racing each other in what must be the most ridiculously <laughs> fun <laughs> forms of transport you've ever seen. Yeah, trust me, if you've ever wanted to own a tank, then you're going to absolutely love the next part. See you in a couple of minutes after this break. <laughs> Welcome back to the final part of this week's challenge and you'll remember it's all about combat. We've already played each other in a real life version of a video game, a part of the challenge that I won. Yeah, all right. And we already tested some hardcore high-tech walking boots, which I think you'll find I won. Yes, but for the final part of our combat challenge, as is often the case in the Gadget Show, we decided to go with a race. So, who would be victorious and who would pretend that they'd been a pacifist all along and weren't really that bothered about winning anyway? <laughs> we would be racing in these, a pair of tanks. They're the ultimate big boys toy. They measure just seven feet long, weigh 300 kilos, and start at just over eight grand. But they're road legal, so you can pop out of the shops in one. Although I'm not quite sure where you'd put your bread and milk. Our challenge was a straight race. So after a short practice, we lined up for the start. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> I couldn't believe it! In my excitement, I'd pushed my control levers the wrong way and blown the start! But then it was my turn to make a mistake. Going too wide on the first bend, I let Jason slip through on the inside. Now I was playing catch-up. Now, you may have noticed that the tank's barrels have a lens in them. That's because soon they'll be able to fire infrared beams at each other. The idea is that if you're behind in the race, you can aim at three sensors on the tank in front. If you get a direct hit, then their tank is disabled for 10 seconds. That's for the future. But for now, we were in a straight race, and Susie managed to regain the lead yet again because I got heavy-handed with the controls. Which is surprising because these things have a very straightforward no-frills control system. Just a pair of levers that you push forward to go forward and back to go back. If you want to turn, you just push one lever. Look out, puddle! Wow! Oh my god! Each tank is powered by a Honda GX390 engine, similar to what you'll find in an off-road go-kart. So while its top speed is only 20 miles an hour, they'll pretty much drive on any surface, grass, mud, sand or rubble. After pushing Susie hard for a whole lap, she got it wrong on a tight bend. Got momentarily stuck on a tree root, yeah, what a manoeuvre! What a manoeuvre! Yeah! And I swept elegantly past on the outside. Having extracted myself from my predicament, I set off after trooper bribery. Woo! Eat my barrel! Over the next two laps, we swapped the lead four more times. Oh, no! She who dares, come no! on! And with just half a lap to go, I cut inside Susie and took the lead. I could smell victory. Get out of the bloody way! But then, just metres from the finish line, disaster struck! Stop. And I got stuck. I'm stuck. Oh, I just can't get out. This is so annoying. And that meant I cruised across the line. She who dares win! Come on! Damn it! What's happened? Look! Look! The track's come off! Can you see? Isn't that just my luck? Oh, but lucky for Jace, I was playing nice and went to rescue him. Come on, love. Let's go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> hey, Suze, you look ridiculous in that tank. I look ridiculous? What do you think that you <laughs> look like? It was those helmets. I oh, know, those big fast jet helmets in those little tanks. I know, fantastic. Great bit of technology, though, don't you think? Great really well tech. executed. Really, really nice good idea. Fun. Yeah. And I won the challenge. Oh, you did. you did. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we have to say good night.
Good night.